Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, what up? And we're back with my homie Grant here, and we're going to talk about all things cold therapy, how you can change your life and shift timelines and so many good things that we don't even know we're going to talk about yet. So super stoked for this. No idea. But before we dive in, as always, been doing this a lot on the pod recently, let's just drop into some breath. So if you are listening and you're driving, you can breathe with us. Just please don't close your eyes. So whatever you're doing, I invite you to breathe with us. If you're in a place where you can sit down and close down your eyes, I invite you to find a seat, feeling your feet on the floor, straightening up the spine, opening the chest, and through the nose, inhaling all the way up. And sighing it out through the mouth. Another inhale through the nose, slowly inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Hold the breath, roll back the eyes. Continuing to hold the breath. And through the mouth, exhale, let it go. One last one through the nose, inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Sip in a bit more. Hold the breath, roll back the eyes, squeeze your root if you would like, and just feel. And through the mouth, exhaling it out, letting it go, letting it go, letting it go. When you're ready in your own time, flickering the eyes open. And here we are. Grant, I'm so stoked to have you. I want to say back on the Soul Seeker podcast because you are back on it. I just didn't release the first one because I was like, man, I was off that day. And, you know, standards, right? So let's redo this thing. So happy to have you here again. Dude, I'm so stoked to have another go with this. You know what I mean? And I just want to say, man, I think that's so cool. I think I think it requires a lot of awareness to be able to go, you know, like I know we already recorded it. We already got it. And I think in a day and age where everything is always about content, to, to go back and be like, man, that's not what I wanted it to be. And to be willing to like go back and hit it again. I think that's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting, thank you received. And it's an interesting thing to sit with too, because sometimes when, I mean, I've probably done like 500 podcasts at this point and sometimes that's happened where it's like, yeah, I, I want to go about it again. Other times I'm like, man, that wasn't my best work or just something fell off. And it's like, well, shoot, whatever, just, just let it out. It's not that big a deal. Um, so I mean, it, it's interesting because you can make a case either way. And for me, it's like, as long as I feel like myself and the guests were being authentic, that's what matters. But I also noticed like, When you and I recorded, I was um, definitely more in a funk and like a negative frequency. And we were talking about a lot of things like subconscious mind, this and that. And I was like, man, this just kind of felt like kind of negative, not on your side, but just like what I was saying. I was like, yeah, that's not what I want to be about, you know? So anyways, so let's dive in. Cold therapy, just 
everything you want to share about cold therapy, ice baths, tell us a little bit about your history with cold therapy and the company you work for doing that. Cause I actually got to join you seeing you and your element walking people through cold plunges for the first time. And it was awesome to see that. So mm -hmm. stage is yours. Talk with us about cold therapy. Cool. Well, you know, again, thank you so much for having me on. Um, you know, I think, I think cold therapy is really cool because of what it is. Uh, it, it's universal. And that's why I use it is I have clients all around the world and anywhere you go, you know, 32 degrees is 32 degrees, unless you're in Canada at zero degrees Celsius. It, so it's like, and it's actually been a lot of fun. I've had to learn to start doing like temperature conversions and stuff between Celsius a lot more. Um, but so I use it with all my clients and I have for years, uh, because what I do is I do, um, high performance coaching and the, and subconscious reprogramming. And the first thing you have to do with that is people have to learn how to be able to regulate their nervous system. And because anytime we're going to make any kind of changes in our subconscious changes in our lives, your subconscious is always going to want to take over. And when it wants to take over, it's going to be perceiving the threat. Cause then we're going to go into our brain. We're going to perceive whatever threats are around us. Your brain wants survival. And then we're going to want to relapse back into ha habitual patterns. So we're going to want to do the same thing we always do. So we're going to just continue to experience life the same way. So I've always used cold immersion as a way to help people start creating resiliency within their nervous system so that it can start making those changes. A couple of years ago, well, it's actually, I started with it in uh, 2007, 2007 when I was playing football at Ohio State and I was a walk-on and I all I wanted to do was to stand out from everybody else because I felt like I was always the underdog. And so one of the ways was, is like after practice, we'd all jump in this huge, massive cold tub you could hold like 30 guys and everyone would be like freezing. They'd be like, you know, shrugging their shoulders up and they'd be like, ooh, ooh, you know, like making all this noise. And I was like, well, what can I, any situation where I could do something different. So I forced my body to just relax. I, I, I didn't know any, I didn't know anything about, you know, the nervous system or, or communication with the body. I just was forcing myself to relax so that I looked like something different. And the crazy thing is it is it's now I know it is the physical override that you can do for yourself. So uh, about a year ago, there was a, a company that was going to be launching a new, uh, new cold tub uh, with, their, with everything else that they do called Therasage, who are kind of the leaders in infrared and red light technology and uh, big in the biohacking space, but it's now branched off into a lot of other industries. Um, and when they were launching it, they had asked us to come kind of like be there. We, we had a friend that was a, um, a, a mutual partner with them. And they're like, ah, you know, he's really good at this. So we got to go hit it off with the owners really, really well. And originally it was my wife and I at the time, and it was a blast. It was so cool. It reminded me of bartending back in the day. And I loved bartending because it was just high volume of, of humans. Like you get to meet so many different people. You get to interact with them. You get to talk to them. And this was just like at conventions, we were just firing people through these. And after the first day we did it, the, the owners were like, man, we absolutely love what you guys do. And we, we want, we don't know how, we don't know exactly, we don't know who you are, but they're big on energy and frequency. And they're like, we like you guys a lot. Like we feel it. it. It feels right. It feels aligned. So they invited us to another one over the summer out in LA. And then they essentially, by the time we left that trip, they were like, we want you to do all of these with us. And they were kind of starting this whole new branch within their business because uh, the two owners are 68 and 70 years old, and they literally have done every event by themselves for the last 25 years. So they started bringing on a team. And man, throughout the fall, I think we went nine or 10 weeks straight, just city to city to city. It was awesome. It was like it was like a rock band tour. And it was all different kinds Sounds of fun. events. Dude, it was so much fun because yeah. it was so many different you know, one day we'd be doing, uh, an event with integrated health. So all these like practitioners that used to do Western medicine and then kind of said, you know, I think there's gotta be a better way than the pharmaceuticals and the way these things are. And they're kind of transitioning into going to a more holistic route. And so it was all these doctors and practitioners, and it was so much fun talking to them and speaking with them. And the very next day it was, we went up to Jacksonville and it was a, a cancer event. Now, I know that sounds a little weird being like, oh, it's a fun cancer, but it's just like you get to talk and you hit on so many different things. And you, so you get to see these people who are transitioning through a time in their life where they're switching from, you know, uh, I, I think it's huge right now with a lot of Western medicine practitioners, doctors, MDs switching over to this holistic route after they have starting to see the insides of the pharma pharmaceutical industry, a lot of other aspects. Um, 
and, and truly wanting the patient to get the care that they want. And I think that's what happens so much in that industry is all these people start out with these great intentions and that's they have these dreams, you know, you see whatever Grey's Anatomy growing up. And then next thing you know, you're like, oh, it's more about the money. It's, it's, it's an industry based around finances than it is helping people. So, and then, so it's, everyone's kind of on the same page there. Everyone's going like that. We can come in contact with are these people who just want to find a better way to live. And what's really cool about cold immersion is I think right now there's this huge kickback against it because I think in the fit, especially in, on social media, but in the fitness industry, it's this, you know, it's this big trend to just kind of call out any trend. Like it's a trend to call out trends. It's a trend to call out people who talk about the carnivore diet or the keto diet or talking about yoga or talking about Pilates or talking about strength. Everyone's got their thing. And I think everyone kind of, we all naturally form our own tribalism. So we want to have common set of beliefs. And if we can all bond over making fun of one thing. So the new thing is, you know, during COVID cold immersion became like a kind of a trend. It did. And a lot of people do do it to, I think, look like a badass. You know, they think because it's hard, it's uncomfortable, but there's so much more to it. And so it's like a lot of people have gone the route of looking at, you know, every at, at events, people come up and they go, okay, so what's the exact temperature to have this at and how long to be in to get the brown fat mobilization and the dopamine this and, you know, Huberman says X, Y, Z and all these people are geniuses. But I'm like, okay, forget all that, you know, because people go, here's the benefits I want. I'm all the way back here. How, how long can I endure this so I can get to the benefits? And it's like, what if you reverse that instead of going, how long can I endure this? What if you change your goal to be how quickly can I regulate back to myself? And then that becomes a metaphor for everything you experience in life. It's your significant other saying something to you and you not firing and responding to them. Well, I don't respond to my significant other. I, I suck it up and I keep it to myself. I'm like, that's even worse. Because then you're holding all that energy in your body, yourself that you actually, it's, it's, again, it comes back to that idea of having poison for the other person, but you're the one drinking it. Because if mm -hmm. you even explode inside, that's, that's cortisol, that's adrenaline, you're elevated. It's not even, it's not just about the physical expression, the tangible outward expression of it and saying words uh, out of anger towards someone. It's what you experience for yourself. So this is a gift for you and the individual. So it's really cool because, you know, your conscious mind is your conscious thinking mind. Your subconscious is your emotional center. So I help people get into their breath, get regulated and get into their body. And it's over the matter of three minutes, within three minutes, you have people that have spent so much time in their masculine energy, in their mind, in their conscious thinking mind, that tapping into their, their subconscious, their, their body, their emotional center for a couple minutes, man, they'll have these emotional breakdowns in there. They'll start crying. They'll, they'll have realizations about things. And it's like, all, all this is available to you all the time. It's just, most of us are scared to tap into it. Man, so much there to unpack. I'm, I'm taking a lot of notes. One of the things I wrote down is cold immersion as a metaphor for life. And I, I really like what you said about like the science and that really resonates with me. And I know uh, I'm getting better at catching myself with that. Like what are the benefits or whatever the thing is versus like, how does it make me feel? You know, I actually spoke with um, Kaiser. That's my uh, doctor. I work with Kaiser this morning. I have a, I don't really talk about this on podcasts or publicly too much, but I don't mind. Um, I have a benign tumor in my pituitary gland and I got an MRI a couple of years ago, whatever. And she, anyways, long story short, doctor wants me to put, uh, wants me to go on this medication called cabergoline, which will help with my prolactin and testosterone levels and blah, 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 all this other stuff listening to the symptoms and also listening to like, oh, you want me to be on that for two years? And at the same time, I'm like, I'm actually feeling really good with my stamina and energy these days due to like surfing more and pushing through it and these awesome supplements that I'm on from a homie that helps with the cells and mitochondria. So literally this morning, I was having the same like thought process of being like, okay, but it, there's that, but I also... I feel good now. So I don't need to worry about that. Kind of like to your point with what, what are the benefits of uh, cold immersion? What's this going to do for me? It's like, uh, slow down. You want to go from here to there. I like the way you put that. That was really cool. Yeah, man. I think, I think that's with a lot of things. I think, you know, we get so we get on a one track mind with the direct one benefit that we think of, you know, people talk about going to the gym, you know, I work out oh, cause I do, I mix a lot of 
fitness and health and nutrition coaching into what I do with people, because that's what we all focus on. And again, not for the sake of let's get a six pack and be jack tan and juicy. It's like, you can't think greater than how you feel. If you're extremely overweight, if you're unhealthy, if you, your digestion is off, like you don't feel good. So if you don't feel good, you're not going to think good. So I'll focus a lot on it from, from that standpoint. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I think, you know, for the gym, using the gym as an example, it's like, okay, I want to go to the gym. Am I, am I getting the six pack? Am I losing pounds? Am I doing this? And it's like, dude, that's just one of the benefits of it. It's like by consistently going and taking care of yourself, you're communicating to yourself at all times. Like I'm worth it. Like I deserve to feel better. I deserve this. I give to myself. And that's what I do with cold immersion is I tell people, I'm like, it, it's all about the way you communicate with your body. Like you have to communicate to yourself. You're safe. So if you go to get in and you go, <laughs> Right. And you're like pumping yourself up. Man. Like that's no different than you getting ready to go into a fight. That's no different than people in the gym going to do a massive deadlift and they sniff an ammonium cap and they throw it. Your body's perceiving there's a threat. If there's a threat, I need to react. And if I need to react, that means I need my nervous system to kick in. And then it's like when people go to get in there, they want to resist it. So they put their hands on the side and they're getting in and they shrug their shoulders up really high and they're going ooh, 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 as they go down. Well, if you remove the tub, when else do you shrug your shoulders up? When you're in a fight, you're getting in a car accident and when you have something coming to hit you to brace. So it's like those physical gestures are all communication with yourself of what's going on in your environment. So for someone listening that either does uh, regularly work with cold immersion, ice baths, cold plunges, things like that, uh, ocean plunges, all of the things, or if someone is just hearing this and like, hmm, I, I, I want to try that. That sounds interesting. How would you recommend them approach it for the next time they go into cold immersion? Yeah, so that's a great question because over the over the years, I've, I've messed around with so many different aspects to it, and especially this last year. So I used to do like 20 minute breath work session and this whole, this whole process. And I caught myself at these events because I was doing these events all the time. And I'm like, oh, it's a metaphor for life. You know, think about it this way. It's the resiliency, it's the ability to build back. And I'm like, wait a minute, when in life are you hit with adversity? And you're like, hang on, give me 20 minutes to hit this breath work session. Let's, let's get optimized first. <laughs> like, right. Wait till it's more conducive for me usually it's something catches us off guard something usually it's something that uh i think the most habitual thing for people that people tangibly experience on a daily basis is uh the craving of endorphins like uh, advancing and progressing towards something uh, a project maybe let's say it's a project for work you're sitting down you're working at a pro on this project and you hit a part that you don't feel good about and you don't feel as confident in so what do you do your body's craving that feeling of accomplishment of moving towards the goal so we'll stand up and we'll do some sort of mindless task. And I always call it folding laundry because you can fold laundry. It doesn't require any real brain power out of you or mowing the yard because you can literally look and you can physically see the, the fruits of your labors and it feels good. I accomplished something. That's why when you have a project to do and you're not confident about it, your house will probably be the most clean that it ever is because you'll clean everything. You'll do everything except what you're supposed to be doing. So what I started doing is the moment jumping in the tub hits my mind. I don't have an option. I just stand up and I go do it. Like I just stand up and I go do it right then in that moment. And it's based on three breaths. And I, you know, so once everything's set, I just inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. On my third inhale, I step over on my exhale. I sink all the way down into it because it, to me, that's kind of giving yourself, um, a timeline and we all give ourselves timelines for things. And like, I know I have to do this, Mm, but I'm going to go do this first. I'm going to do this first. I'm going to make sure I feel better about this first. Maybe I need to go for a walk first. Maybe I need to do this. And it's like, no, you don't just do the damn thing. And if you practice that over and over and over, that literally becomes your new habit. And that's what I think is one of the coolest things for people to understand. Anytime you start something new, it sucks and you should suck at it. Like you're not going to be good at it. It's new. If it's uncomfortable, I, I learned this in a, a NLP course I was taking because the first day felt so good. Like, and I think every, like collectively there's about 150 people in the room. The first day felt so good. Everything the guy was saying made so much sense. The second day, everybody, like you could see it on everyone's face. Everyone's kind of like leaning back and their eyes are big and they're like, uh, what? And then we were doing, we break off into these groups and work on a, like a exercise or something. And everyone was doing the same thing. We're all like, uh, so I was just like, do you, do you feel really unconfident in this? Everyone's like, yeah. And I'm like, so do I, I think we all do. 
And it, that was the goal of the entire day, because at the end, the, the guy leading the class was, he said, you know, if, if you're uncomfortable when you're trying something, it means you're learning, like you're learning something so new. That's a sign to you. We just don't like that feeling. So it is going to suck. So if you just started doing cold immersion, like it's uncomfortable, it's just uncomfortable. But if you stick with it and you start learning how to regulate to it, it starts running habitual in the background. Like we all run on programs. Everything we do is running on a program by and large though. And I always use the example of, have you ever driven somewhere that's like 20, 30 minutes away that you drive out to on a regular basis and you've gotten there before. And all of a sudden you're like, how did I get here? I don't even remember. Oh my God, I blacked out. And it's like, you mean to tell me that you were driving 40, 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, uh, making turns, stopping at stoplights and not hitting people ideally. And you did all that and you don't even realize you were doing it. Like you didn't, it didn't require you to think that means you are running on a program. Like your body just knows how to do that pattern better than your brain does. So it's how many other places in your life are you doing that where you're not going, Oh, I have options. I have different routes I can take. And you, but you keep ending up in the exact same destination all the time. And I think that's what cold immersion does. It forces you to get into your body. Cause if you go in your head, it sucks. You got, you're going to have to get out. So if someone's getting in, it's the ability, I think, to observe the relationship between your body and your brain. And to me, you're not your body or your brain. You're the consciousness utilizing both of them. Like if you're an, mm -hmm. as an astronaut trying to walk in space, you can't, you can't survive in that environment without an astronaut suit and, and external oxygen. Uh, your consciousness would have nothing to be housed within without this meat suit, without your body. And this body comes with the brain. And the way I see it is both of them have default factory settings, like kind of like your cell phone, you know, you can go into your cell phone and you go into the back end and turn off and toggle off all these settings that are like tracking your location and advertisements and all these things. But if you don't know that you have that capability, if you don't know, those are settings. If you don't know, those are things that have options to go the other direction. Why would you ever go do that? So when you realize that the way you perceive threat, the way you perceive depression, anxiety, feelings, emotions, uh, environments, things around you, people, places, all the conclusions we have about everybody around us and ourselves, it's just a habit. And we have all the ability to implement a new habitual thought pattern in that place. It's just very, very difficult at first. So most people don't stick with it long enough to actually see it through. But if you habitually wake up with anxiety every morning, you can shift that to habitually wake up knowing that you can put yourself into a positive state because you don't, you're not going to wake up in a positive state. Nobody's ever woken up laughing, but we will wake up with a, like on a regular basis with anxiety, fearing the day because we're so used to it. Yeah. That's, that's a really good place to uh, shift into handling our emotions. Like how, how do you work with your clients or recommend someone listening? That's like, yes, 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 yes. That's me. I, I wake up with anxiety or I experience a lot of stress, whatever situation is like, I obviously have my six step breath process from my new book that helps with that. But what, what for you works? Uh, I think it's realizing that there's always a better way to live. Like there's always a better way you can feel. Um, but it's knowing that you have a choice and you have to choose to change. So it's, it's realizing that. So when we start getting a, a, it starts as a feeling in our body. So we'll feel something like maybe you take a deep breath, uh, because most of us breathe into our ribs all the time. Very rarely do we breathe into our, our belly. And so we shallow breathe all the time and we don't breathe into our belly because we want our bellies to be tiny and small and skinny. And we want to fit into society and, and look the part and look in shape. Uh, if you're a guy, dude, I growing up, I, I was, I was extremely overweight. I had like a big luscious man rack. So I hunched over. So on top of breathing, I was, I was, I mean, I was basically 200 pounds, five foot 10 by the time I was 12 years old. And it was not all muscle by any means. I mean, I was a really? plump little kid. So all the way up until I was about 26, 27 years old, I breathed into my ribs all the time because I was overweight. And then I lost about a hundred pounds over the course of a year. And even at that, I still breathe the same way because it is what I habitually had always done. So when else do you breathe into your ribs? When do you shallow breathe? When you have anxiety, when you're under attack, when there's a threat, we're shallow breathing. So we're literally physically putting ourselves into this heightened state all the time. So it's to start getting in touch with your body. Like your body is your feeling state from your neck down is a recollection. It's like a catalog of every emotion you've ever felt. So you feel that first. And then 
uh, immediately it shoots up to the brain and the brain is a catalog, uh, like a Rolodex of every memory you've ever had. So it's like trying to match cards. So you experience the feeling in your body and now you're trying to label it with something so that you can understand it in your brain. And your brain only has four functions and it's, it's survival, pain, avoidance, energy efficiency. And the last is pleasure. So it's like the first things it's going to look at is how is this a threat? How is this going to be something that wants to kill me, take me out? That's why we have a negative bias in our brain. So the, the primarily you're always going to look at the worst things first. Your, your brain is set up to try to move away from pain before it is to move towards pleasure. So it's understanding you're going to find all the reasons everything happening around you is awful before you go, Hey man, this is great. Like your brain's not trying to make you happy. That requires you, you have to make that effort. So if you wake up in the morning with habitual anxiety, or let's say you wake up and what do we do? We roll over and we grab our cell phone and we look at our cell phone and, and we get on social media and we start comparing ourselves to everything else immediately. Or we look over and we start looking at our, our, our text messages. Well, look at all those messages. Look at those emails. Look at wherever, wherever you have co uh, correspondence coming in. Oh, I feel so good. Why? Because that's kind of almost like oxytocin happening now because I have a connection with people and things, but it's kind of a false sense, but that's within the first 20 minutes of your day, your first 20 minutes of your day, your brain is operating in a theta uh, state of theta, which is what you operate in from conception to seven, eight years old before you have a frontal cortex. So that's why you're, you're a sponge. That's the idea of making your bed first thing in the morning, investing into your day. That's why when your alarm goes off, you want to jump up and go about your day. Instead of rolling out, you pull that blanket back over you. You are literally programming yourself in those first 20 minutes for your entire day. I'm seeking comfort. I don't want, I don't want to be uncomfortable. Um, or you can go the other way. I'm going to make my bed. I'm going to invest into my day. I'm going to do the difficult thing. I'm going to move my body. So just as like a little trick that I do and, uh, you know, something started doing about a year ago was we wake up first thing in the morning, like you already have a song queued up and mm -hmm. it you like put on that song and it literally you do a dance party. You just dance. Like you do an entire dance party and it feels so silly. And people like dudes will hear that and be like, Oh, that's gay. And okay. it's like, what? Like, dude, it's because you are so uncomfortable to move your body. But the whole idea is emotion is just energy in motion. So if you want to change your emotion, you change your motion, you change the way you're moving. So if we don't wake up in, an, in, a, in a positive state by default, like again, I said, you know, we've never woken up laughing. The, the highest frequency, like, like all the higher frequencies that we want and, and emotions we want, happiness, joy, love, compassion, all these things. Well, that requires our energy. We have to make that happen. Now, like depression, anxiety, anger, all these things are low vibrations. Those are low frequencies. They don't require anything out of you. That's why it doesn't take anything to go to that place. And again, you have that negative bias in your brain. So you have to take action, man. And you have to do it immediately, but you have to choose this because you're going to like, you might hear this. I challenge anyone who's listening to this to literally put an alarm in your phone, cue up a song, have it ready to go, whatever it is like something high energy and just move your body in the morning. It's not about dancing in like a style and it's not even ecstatic. Dance. It's just like, I mean, maybe that would be called ecstatic dance. Cause it's just like dude, flail your body around, like jump, bounce around. Like if you just sit there and you shake, like you, like you bounce up and down, shake your arms out. All you're doing is you're moving that energy around in your body. You're going to laugh at yourself. You're going to start laughing. In fact, the first bunch of times I did it, I cried literally like, like a grown ass man dancing at 5. AM in the morning in his house, dark. And I'm crying. And it's because it's literally, it'll bring up the emotions that you have, but those emotions are meant to be felt. And if you want to talk about emotions, if everyone talks about control your emotions, you don't control your emotions by suppressing your emotions. You control them by mastering them. And you can only master anything when you allow yourself to truly experience it. Yeah. Amen. Awesome. I love that. And the, the music piece of it also for me about a year ago, I started doing the same thing, uh, especially when I got really deep with subconscious mind type stuff. And I have a playlist that I'll put in the show notes so you guys can check it out. It's called Limitless Vibes. And I actually just happened to share that with my private breath club this morning. Um, there's a song by the band Expendables. And how does it start? It's like, take a breath, not from your chest, from, from your gut, not your chest, something like that. It's just like cool to hear, you know, reggae band talking about that. But all of the songs on this playlist are mostly pretty much all reggae. And it all 
all has to go with the subconscious mind. Because when I started to go deep into the subconscious mind last year, that was also like, I had the story of, oh, my life in, is imploding. This is the most challenging time of my life. And then I'm starting to listen to these songs and be like, okay, here's a song where they're talking about visualization and how like they visualize them being on stage and now it's happening. And, you know, just all this different stuff. And I'm like, oh, it's hitting a different way. And one of the songs that's by the band Soja, um, it's called Everything Changes. And I remember when everything went down for me in 2023, the, exactly what you're talking about, like having an impromptu quote unquote dance party in the kitchen. And next thing you know, like I just fell to my knees, broke down crying. And I'm like, typically if I'm crying, that means I got one small little tiny tear just like coming down my cheek. But I was like talking about breaking down crying and what allowed that to happen was the several songs before that of the dancing of moving the energy so I'm, I'm so stoked to hear you talk about the the music because that's one thing that I've needed to come back to time and time again this year like where I feel like I'm in a funk it's like oh yeah get back to the basics like if I start my morning with my playlist limitless vibes which I did this morning I'm like I know it's off to a good start. And then the other thing with the oxytocin being released, like we think like, oh, I'm going to check my text messages or, or email, social media, right? It could be any of these things where you think it's going to give you oxytocin or dopamine, whatever that's going to make you feel good, right? But then you see one little thing and to your point, it's like, okay, now you just gave away all your power and it's like now your energy's messed up and you need to work towards it again. So definitely have that time to yourself. I, I love that you talked about that and the belly breaths. Let's get into like communication and relationships. I'm of the belief that the hardest part of the human experience are relationships. And I think that is really the purpose of being a human on this master class on earth. So how can we be more effective with our communication to have better relationships? Yeah, dude, I, I love this because it's, it's, it's the, it's the one thing I work with all my clients on is, and it's, is, is relationships. Like the goal of life is relationships. The, the uh, literally the apex of everything that we do is based around relationship and people will be like, no, no, it's based around making money. Really? Why do you think you want to make so much money? What do you, what do you want to drive that Lamborghini for? If you were just sitting in that Lamborghini driving it, do you see that actual Lamborghini? Do you like, do you see it? Yeah, no, everyone right? outside of you sees it. It's like all the money in the world. Well, what does it matter how much money you actually have? If you're capable of doing the things, but if nobody else could see you doing those things, would you still want those things? Would you want to do them? And it's like, why do we want to be in shape? Well, I want to be in shape to feel good. Right. That that's cool. That's the part that most people don't say most like very rarely does anyone go, man, I really want to have a six pack because I want to, I think that will be the end result of me actually being healthy and I'll feel confident about myself. No, it's because we go, I'm going on vacation. I'm going to have a bathing suit on. Well, what does that matter? Oh, because other people are going to see me. Everything we do is to be good enough for a potential mate, a partner, um, to, to attain love in our life based on the way we think we want it as opposed to what do we actually feel? So a lot of the time, I think we're so disassociated from ourselves because we don't, we, we're, we are, we're, I think we're involuntarily focused on those relationships of being enough for somebody else uh, that, well, let's put it like this. It all starts at a young age. And like I said, we're in, our brains are operating in theta the first seven years of our life. So we're a sponge. We don't question things. Like when, when, when we talk about like the frontal cortex and logical thinking, that's what gives you discernment. So if someone looks at you and they go, mm, you look stupid today. Well, you have discernment. You can go, man, that person might be having a bad day. You can do that now. And you can go, that's actually not a reflection of me. When you're six, five, four, three years old, you don't have that. And because of that, whatever gets said to you, they go, you look stupid. You go, I look stupid. And you anchor it. You want a toy and you ask your mom for it over. Oh, I want this toy. And she goes, you don't deserve it. You don't hear oh, mom might be struggling financially and she can't afford this toy. You hear, I don't deserve the things I want in life. And you anchor that as a belief within you. 
And it, it usually is going to be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, sometimes never that it gets so painful in life that you're willing to start looking at these things. And I think that's what we're starting to experience now. And I think a lot of that is due to social media, that it's more widespread information about the acceptance of doing the deep work on yourself, the, the introspective work, the uh, self-development, all these things, like you can call it whatever you want. I call it dark work because right. it's not, not even shadow. Like I think everyone has different terminology for it. And I'm like, Hey, why don't you just optimize yourself and whatever that looks like? <clears throat> because at the end of the day, the most important relationship you're ever going to have is the one with yourself. If you get that one in check, all your other relationships will fall into place. Because if I'm more focused on my relationship with you than I am with myself, that means I'll go outside of my boundaries, outside of my standards. And at that point, I'm abandoning myself. Well, I'll experience abandonment of myself my entire life to trying to be enough for somebody else. And then what do I do? Oh, my parents abandoned me. And you blame it and you pawn it off on something else. No, it's you. And when you come home to yourself for the first time, it's, it's an amazing feeling because at that moment you go, oh shit, it was just me this entire time I left myself. And then it's emotional. It's very emotional because you're like, God, everything I've experienced up until now is, it was just skewed. It was through this weird lens. And at that moment, you really, and like, I wish everybody would be willing to do this. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of, it's what I, it's what my, my goal is in life. My, my mission, I feel like that's what I was put here for is to help bridge this gap for people is to bring people from, because I think, I think a lot of people that are leaders or thought leaders in this realm of personal development or, or coaching, guidance, mentorship, whatever it is, I think a lot of them were already there. And a lot of times when we accomplish something in life, we want to disassociate from the part of us that got us to that point. So someone gets in really good shape. Maybe they used to be overweight. Well, now they have a six pack. They disassociate from ever being out of shape, which means they shut off this part of their brain that allows them to have empathy and compassion and understand truly where they once were to allow them to truly connect with other people. So they don't see it. They, they are trying to still be enough as opposed to going, I can actually help reach back and pull these people up with me. And then lead them also because I understand them. It's me. I'm you. We're the same thing. When you understand yourself, you understand everybody because you are everybody and everybody is also you. And this isn't like one of those like feel good things. Like we all deserve a trophy. We're all on the same page and we all have the same capabilities. This is saying like, we're actually all the same. If you think about it, it's, and I always compare it to the game of Plinko and uh, the price is right. You know, if anyone doesn't know what that is. It's just I don't. a big, oh, really? Oh my yeah. gosh. Come on, man. Vert, yeah. uh, like, okay. So Planko is this big giant board. I don't know. It's probably 20 feet wide, 20 feet tall. And there's a, a, like a disc that you drop from the top and there's all these slots across and there's all these pegs all the way down. So at the bottom, there's the outcome. And it's almost kind of like wheel of fortune. Like if you, you could drop this over here, over top of the million dollar mark, but it's going to probably bounce around a whole bunch of times and you might end up way over on the other side, or you might, it might cross all the way over the board and end up coming back and hitting that million dollars. It's, it's that all these pegs will make it take a different path in life. And to me, we're all dropped at the same way at the top of that board. And every peg that we hit throughout life represents the, the family we were brought up with, the environment we experienced, the sequence of events we had, the pain points, the traumas, all these things that shape us because when we're dropped, all it is when we're brought into this world, it's not about the color of our skin or sexual orientation, any of these things. We are all just have the same basic human needs that we want to fulfill. The biggest pain that you experience in life is your lack and ability of knowing how to fulfill your own human needs. And then we start seeking them outside of us at a young age. We start with parents, ask, uh, let's say permission. Uh, you know, can I stay out late? Then it's teachers. Can I go to the bathroom? Then it's coaches. Can I have a water break? Then it's uh, college professors. Can I have an extension on my midterm? Then it's bosses. Can I have next week off work? We spend our whole life seeking these things outside of us. We want our parents' love. When you were a year old, you didn't care if you woke up at 1 a.m. and you'd shit your diaper and you go, oh, well, mom and dad are sleeping. I don't really want to wake them up and be inconvenient. You screamed, you cried, you did whatever you had to do. You followed your intuition to get the thing that you needed in life. If you were hungry, you did the same thing. But eventually, maybe three, four years old, and you started speaking regularly, they started saying, don't do this, do this instead. Don't take, talk to this person. Don't eat that. Don't put that in your mouth. Don't stick your finger in a light socket. And it's all these don't, 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 don't. 
out of the sake of keeping you safe. But what do you do? You start chipping away at everything you are as an individual and you start taking away your own intuition to start listening to someone else tell you whether you're right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And at that point, again, this is during the stage where you're being programmed. So we learn to seek all these things outside of us. When you learn to start giving these things to yourself, that is the relationship with yourself. You stop showing up in the world, expecting everyone else to fulfill you and you fulfill yourself. And most of us are all trying to do this shit where we're like, oh, I'm helping these people and I want to help people. And I, no, you're, you're, that's a coping mechanism. If you haven't already done it for yourself, it's actually a coping mechanism to try to be enough so that you can experience a level of somethingness uh, and relevancy. And people go, oh my God, you helped me so much. And then, but it, it becomes like a drug. You need your next hit over and over and over coaches, a lot, a lot of bodybuilding coaches, a lot of fitness type coaches, like they, they do this because and I've experienced this in the realm of they, they experience this joy and success for about 20 minutes on a show day. And then it's back to the drawing board. And we have to go through another week before we get to experience it again, because I only experience it as a sec. They only experience it as a secondhand high through their clients. And it's like, don't get me wrong. It is such a high. It is. I, I tell people all the time when they ask, you know, what's the guarantee of working with you? I'm like, well, I, my guarantee is built into my business. This is selfish. I'll tell you right now, you're just, you just happen to be on the receiving end of my selfishness because this feels so good because I'm going to use all of my pain. I'm going to use all of my failures in life and I'm not going to let them be in vain. I'm, that's how I'm going to help you. So it's utilizing everything I've experienced. It's just really cool that on the other side of it, you get to experience total liberation and it expedites your process through this entire thing. But it only came when I finally was willing to look at myself and work on myself because man, that is some of the hardest shit you'll ever do but I think we get to a point where it's like a fork in the road and it looks like either taking your own life or you're going to, I'm going to change. And unfortunately it takes, I would say about 90%, 99% of us. I think Joe Dispenza is the one who says it, where he's like, you can change in a place of joy, happiness and fulfillment, or you can change in a place of pain, disparity and hopelessness. And I think most of us fall into that category. It has to be so painful before we're willing to try something that seems uncomfortable because we're like, man, at that point, it's like nothing could be more uncomfortable than this. Yeah, that's usually, it seems to be, a, it's the, that's the catalyst. And then it's also the gift. And we need to learn that it's happening for us, right? And we use that as an anchor. We don't need to necessarily ask the question, how is this happening for me? But just anchor it in like, this is happening for me and this is a gift. And that will help with that shift. I love what you're saying about, you know, having the, the most meaningful relationship is the relationship with yourself. It makes me think since we're talking about morning routines and it's not something I read as much these days, but earlier this year, I had a morning prayer that I would read every day. And I, I went from the past few years of most days, uh, either morning or night, having a prayer that was like intuitive with that moment that I felt as opposed to this was more of like a morning prayer of an affirmation, if you will, to set the day start. And there's a sentence in there that's something along the lines of like, I, I walk through my day seeing the mirrors of my own reflection that's asking for tender love and grace, something along those lines. And I know that when I can see myself in others in every single situation interaction, you know, like this morning, I was out uh, surfing and there were a few guys like that were a ways away being really loud, talking about like something personal. And it was just like, you know, a lot of surf etiquette is not really surf etiquette, but um, I wouldn't say it's etiquette, but surf culture is like kind of like, especially up here in Santa Cruz, like head down, stick to yourself and be quiet. You know, there's not a lot of just like, uh, like you do it, you know, it's, it's pretty serious, which I always thought was kind of funny, but the, the these guys were being extra loud. So I was like, hmm, why is this coming into my field? So I started listening to what they were saying. I was like, this is actually something I was just working with an hour ago. Of course, I'm hearing this right now. So the point being like, maybe we're not going to be so like, you know, meticulous with every single interaction in the day, but especially the ones that are like blaring right in our face, like, okay, that is a mirror for me. There's a reason why that's showing up. And where is that in me? And that is the deeper work that you're talking about. And I just, I just love that work so much. It's been so impactful for me. Dude, I think when, when you realize that, and I don't want to say realize I, when you're willing to accept 
that everybody around you is, is actually a reflection of you in some form or another. And, and now there's also, there's a caveat to that because there's also assholes out there. So it's like a lot of the times it's like, well, this person's actually just being rude. And you're like, how is that a reflection of me? And it's not, it isn't that necessarily isn't, but maybe that's a thing showing you to have discernment, to be able to look at yourself and have a knowingness of yourself to go, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't, it, maybe this isn't me. Yeah. And I'll add to that. Like it may not necessarily be like a reflection of that part of ourselves but like in this example of that person being rude it's shining a light on how that makes us feel and the other relationships that we have in our life and maybe need that that healing there you know so it's not all I, that's a very very fun thing to talk about now that you bring that in you know yeah i think uh i think a lot of the time other people's strengths will expose our weaknesses to us mm -hmm. and we might not realize that that's what's happening and I mean, I, I'll be honest, there's been times that I've looked at people and I'm like, man, I really don't enjoy these people at all. And it's like a year later that all of a sudden I'm willing to accept it that I actually realize I'm like, oh, it's because they're actually really good at this thing that I'm not very good at. And it's, I don't like the way it's making me feel. And that's one of the biggest things to realize too. You have to have grace with yourself when you're trying to understand your emotional states and, and, and realize it, it is, it's a process and these things will happen faster and faster and faster but it, it all comes down to your willingness to look at yourself and go, why, like, why is this happening? Why do I feel this way? As opposed to judging yourself for feeling that way or judging someone else. And, and it's almost like if you can, instead of becoming reactive to get intrigued, like the more interested you can get in it, dude, the more you're going to just dive into it. Think of anything you get intrigued by. You research it. You look it up. You look for anecdotal evidence. You look for scientific evidence. You look for everything you could use to help formulate it for you. And it's instead of trying to understand the other person, why did they say that? It's understand yourself. Why did this affect me? Why did this bother me? It, it, let me jump in here. Cause this is, this is a fun one too. Like it, it gets into projections, right. And a little bit of narcissistic type traits where like w in a situation, someone can easily kind of start projecting their own beliefs as opposed to asking why and getting curious and hearing you say that I'm like, I'm starting to connect the dots of different conversations I've been in recently where they were asking the questions and like getting curious to your point, but on it, probably on a subconscious level, it was so that they could further their point and gaslight you. You know, um, and that's like the hidden, like, oh my God, because there is some talk about like, you know, using spiritual or mindful or whatever you want to call it, like lingo and, and whatever it is to like prove your, I'm not explaining it well. Um, but you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, yeah, because I, I actually just saw something about this yesterday is that, um, because it's it's like uh, the idea of spirituality and, and energy and all these things is like, there's not the tangible thing in front of you to prove it or disprove it. So a lot of times people can end up kind of hiding behind it to prove their point that much more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I have another question I, I've, I wrote down that I've been meaning to ask you. So you brought up a six pack multiple times and you brought up that you were overweight and you've also talked about like, you know, what is the deeper thing that you want there for people listening that aren't familiar with like who you are, what you look like, you're jacked, you know, like you're ripped right now. Right. So like you got the body, you got the six pack, all of that. You went from being overweight. Like how'd that feel when you uh, finally like got this physique? And I know it's not like one day you snap your fingers and you're like, Oh no, no, I got the six pack, you know, like it's over time. Like, was there a time where you're like, Oh wow. Like I I've been working so hard for this. And I thought I'd feel this, but what'd that all look like for you? Yeah, man. Um, it's, it's really cool because so the, the most interesting thing is, is especially for people that don't know me or my personality, like I would listen to this. I'd be like, what a douche, like, Oh, got a six pack thinks he's cool. It's not about that. It's like, I only have, I only look the way I do not because of the work it is. It's a combination of the work I've done on the outside, but it's when it, my body really changed. My physique really changed when I started healing myself on the inside, when I started processing my pain, uh, the things I'd been through in life, my thought processes, you know, it's, it's interesting that people don't, 
they like I can't believe that they don't teach us in school about our mm -hmm. nervous system. It's it's mind blowing because our nervous system controls everything. So when your nervous system kicks in, you're pumping out cortisol, adrenaline, and I'm talking about, you know, your sympathetic nervous system. You're pumping all these things out and it's like having this constant drip. And and for women, women stay active and and elevated for up to 24 hours and men up to 9 hours. Sorry ladies. But um even at that, it doesn't matter because it's like a domino effect. Like when's the last time you did one thing that that triggered you and you were just like, mm, okay, I'm good for the next 24 hours. And it's like a full reset. And then no, it's like you spill your coffee, you go shit. And then you stub your toe because now you're moving around a little bit different. Ah, damn. Then you catch your dress on something. Then you, you do this or this isn't right. Or you forget something at home. And then you're driving to work and you're, you're paranoid because you're like, oh, I'm late now because I spilled coffee on my shirt. Now I had to change my shirt. Now I'm running late. Now my boss is going to whatever. So in your mind, you start playing out all these scenarios of what your boss is going to do. And you start responding to it in your head. And this, this is now plug in any scenario for this, whether it's relationships or with your boss or friends, like you start playing out the scenarios in your head and it's real. Your brain is so subjective. It doesn't know the difference between you creating it in your mind and actually experiencing it. So what happens, we then get ourselves in front of these people and maybe that individual is not going to give us that stimulus at all, but we're ready to respond to that stimulus and we'll force that person into that. Like we'll, we'll take whatever they give us and we'll manipulate the information around us just because your brain has this thing called your reticular activator. Whatever you tell it, it's looking for, it will find that information and it'll twist the information to, to give you what you tell yourself you're looking for. So it's just, it's like... I got off on a little bit of a tangent. What was the actual question? <laughs> no, 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 that, that was good because it, there's a lot to talk uh, about loops right here. You know, um, I had Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor on the podcast, who is like the creator, if you will, of the 92nd rule. She was named one of times most influential, 100 most influential people or something. And the 92nd rule teaches that our body has a 92nd physiological response when we experience these energies that are in motion. So then it's easy for someone to be like, well, how come I am I? Why am I still feeling this way? And I counted 90 seconds or it was a few minutes. And it's like, well, you're playing out another loop to your point. So that's why this is so important to understand this and also to understand how to regulate your nervous system. And, you know, I hearing you talk, I could hear in my mind. Dolores Cannon's voice. And there's this video where she goes, let it go let it go like she just keeps saying let it go and it's like that's it i even had a situation this morning with a friend where it was just like wait what and i went out surfing surfing i processed it a little bit and i was like yeah this isn't me this is me i'm i'm letting this go like it's not you know sometimes you just gotta let it go whatever's replaying in the mind over and over again um you did mention something about the men and the women having hours to something and that you said it pretty fast and i haven't heard that before could you repeat what you were saying there yeah so when women uh your nervous system gets activated for women it can it can stay active up to 24 hours which means within that 24 window you still have those chemicals being released and but but and, and men uh the it shows up to nine hours now the thing is is every time we're triggered by something new within that window, the clock restarts. So it's not like I got pissed off at 6 a.m. today and I'm a woman and I wake up tomorrow and all these other things happen. And then I got pissed off at noon and then I responded to my significant other. Like they pissed me off at 6 p.m. And I wake up at 6 a.m. tomorrow and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm reset. No, if 6 p.m. was the last thing that it's going to be 6 p.m. the next day. Right. And it just kind of, but it, and it just keeps kind of trailing and it becomes this domino effect. And it's like, if you can think about it, when is the last time you went more than 24 hours without being triggered by anything, without having anything that angered you, ticked you off, made you feel like there was a threat of some sort. So it goes to show that the majority of us are living in a constantly elevated state. And then we attribute it. And then we think we're only actually elevated when we get really enraged, when we're screaming, when we're yelling, but those chemicals are releasing in us all the time. Oh, this ties it all back into the, you were talking about a six pack and it was healing, healing myself from the inside out because it's like, 
and this goes back to the whole idea of cold immersion of people being like, well, I want the benefits of my metabolism speeding up and I want the benefits of brown fat mobilization and I want you know, dopamine and I want to feel better. Okay, well, let's think about this. When your nervous system is activated, your digestive system shuts off, your excretory system shuts off, your sexual reproductive system shuts off, your creativity goes out the window. So you're less creative at work. What do we all talk about? Like, I feel like everyone's always has digestive issues. Everybody has low sex drive and hormones are off all the time. So if I could regulate my nervous system, maybe all of my systems would actually be firing properly and my body would respond to the things I do it. How many people do work out on a regular basis and they go, man, it doesn't matter what I do. Like nothing's happening. Well, if you have cortisol pumping all the time and let's say you go do a workout, now you're giving yourself more stress on your body by physically pushing it. And on top of it, maybe while you're working out, you're talking to yourself about how much you hate your body. You, you hate the way you look this thing that is, and it hears everything you say and do and, and don't even say the thoughts that you have. And it's like, when's the last time, I mean, not you, but when's the last time you thought about breathing? Like, when's the last time you just intentionally breathe? The, the only way anybody actually will die is lack of oxygen to the brain. Now, yes, you can get shot. You can get all these things, but it becomes lack of oxygen to the brain, which is why we die. So the only thing that can kill us is a lack of oxygen and somehow you're alive and you haven't thought about it, that means your body has literally chosen you every second of every day, your entire life. Just imagine what would happen if you started working with it. It's like you've spent your whole life trying to get out to sea with the anchor down. Imagine what would happen if you pulled that anchor up and like how much faster you would go. And it's like when you can optimize all these things, your body will become so responsive to you. I think it's not even just the relationship with yourself. It's the relationship with your body that it becomes the most important so thing. Yeah. Because it That's, dictates that way you feel and the way you, we feel, the emotions we feel control our behavior and our behavior controls our reality. It's really interesting too, to talk with people that are, have a strong fitness background and are into this type of stuff because I definitely have noticed in the past couple of years, like the missing piece for me personally in like my spiritual journey has been like the body and it really talking about like seekers in general. It's so often like whether it's medicines or not, it's about leaving the body, but the integration is coming back in, you know, and um, yeah, it, it is really Really fascinating and i i recently got into doing hit earlier this year and that has been like so good for me to land in my body but at the same time like to your point with hormonal issues and all of that like i also know like yeah th those high intensity workouts actually aren't ideal for uh, for what i've been experiencing so it is interesting to see kind of the in between there. Well, Grant, we've talked on, we've talked a lot on a lot of different uh, topics. There's a couple things that I wrote down that I just wanted to real quick touch on. At the beginning, when we went into cold immersions, you mentioned uh, the conferences that you were going to. So I've seen pictures and videos on Instagram and like you're literally setting up cold plunges at conferences where people are like walking around in, in clothes at just a normal expo type conference. And then all of a sudden there's like Grant and his 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 people saying up uh, their their little location with cold plunges and people are like stripping down to go into the cold plunge like talk with us what that looks like doing a cold plunge at a conference because that is just quite the visual you know it's it's uh it's actually it's really cool you know the, yeah. and it's funny and i one of my favorite things are conferences that are like three days um because the first day is so much of these people walk around and they walk by and they're like you're people aren't actually doing this are they and you're like yeah they're like you, like you bring a bathing suit and they're yeah. like <laughs> are you serious they're like in front of everybody <laughs> i'm like come on i bet you can like, come on you can do this you can totally do this and it's kind of like eh, and you'll see them though the same people i mean there'll be thousands of people at these things and the same people will walk by and they, every time they walk a little slower and they kind of are checking it out to see if anyone's doing it. And usually by the second day, they, they'll, they'll come try it. Or later that afternoon, they come try it. And then they come back the second day, the third day. They want to experience it as many times as they can because it's such a cool experience. So we just have like, we have, we'll have like a pop, we have a pop-up changing tent. Mm. People will go in there and they'll put on a bathing suit. They'll strip down to boxers, whatever it is. We don't really care. We have, we have people just literally wrap a towel around themselves and get in with a towel and it's uh, and don't worry it cleans itself with ozone uh every every three minutes it has ozone blasts that come out so it's it's clean sanitized water um 
it it's 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 like such an extra dynamic i think and, um, and at these it, conferences yeah go ahead well it's just it's an extra dynamic because you the level that people have to go to really fast i mean each individual i take through this we're talking max 10 minutes that between some breath work together getting in the head a little bit and it depends on how busy it is but if it's if it's really busy i mean this will be about a 5 minute experience and in five and in your dating just as deep of an experience, but it's like within that time, I, all I'm doing is I'm calling out all the things you're thinking. I'm going, it's really easy. You hear all this commotion around you and it goes, Oh, that's a distraction. That's not a distraction. What if nothing was actually a distraction in your life? It's so easy for us to think about sounds and noises as distractions. And it's like, that's actually your personal soundtrack. You are the only one that is getting, that's a soundtrack to your life, but we just go, that's a distraction. So it's like, what if you could learn to start working with these things that you use as an excuse to pull yourself out of all the, the focus that you could have? And so it's that. And then they get into the breath really quick. And and then I have them step in. And it's all I tell them is like, I'm not teaching you anything new. I'm going to remind you of everything you wanted to do. But when you got into an uncomfortable state, it started to go out the window. And your body habitually wanted to go back to breathing a certain way. So I'm just going to remind you. And then they get in and some, you know, of course, every now and then some people like they, they start hyperventilating. Like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And they get out. Most people, I'd say about 95% of the people that do it have the biggest breakthroughs because they go and they always say the same thing. They're like, oh, I'm going to try for 30 seconds or a minute. And those are the ones that will end up staying in for five minutes and they get out and they're just mind blown by it. Yeah, when I was with you uh, doing this, uh, watching you uh, in your element, uh, there was a couple people that I think went like 10 minutes, you know, but yeah. it, it, that's a whole nother thing that we're not going to get into. So uh, these conferences, are they like biohacking conferences or what's the most like, you know, like suit and tie type conference that it, it, someone would walk across the expo floor and be like, people are doing what, you know, cause a uh, biohacking conference is like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But like, is there, are any of them like normal quote unquote normal type conferences? Um, it's interesting because the way these things are starting to blend into every industry, the fitness, you know, fitness, fitness has completely evolved. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I am so grateful. I'm 37 years old. I am so grateful to have been born when I was born. I feel like I walk in two different worlds. I, I got to experience life before the internet and social media. Um, you know, I got to experience you know fitness when fitness was, you know, how jacked and big and strong are you and all these things. And it's totally changed. It's evolved. Fitness is now it's about like, how do you feel? And I love it. It's about internal health. Instead of chicken and chicken and brown rice, it's what are you doing to optimize your hormones? What are you doing to optimize the way you feel? Like, how is your gut health? Your gut health is going to be directly linked to your serotonin. And all, it's like, it's so cool to see the way these things go. Um, so I, I think, I think, I think it's really cool, but so we'll do fitness events. We'll do, uh, corporate events. We'll, uh, corporate. that's lot. what I was looking for. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. what type of events are they like the corporate ones, uh, any specific industries that come to mind? Um, so a big one that we're doing now is we're actually Therasage is, uh, is now one of the main sponsors with YPO young presidents organization, right. which is a, is, is a world worldwide organization. And, you know, these are all entrepreneurs. These are all very high level CEOs, entrepreneurs, presidents. And, um, the, the cool and interesting thing about that is you go to a biohacking event and most people understand the technologies to some degree actually no a lot of some of them understand the technologies most of them understand it enough to just be dangerous to themselves because they're just like i heard this and they're like you know they just listen to things on podcasts all the time and they go this is the truth because so and so said it yeah. and so all they're all they're doing is comparing they're going so what makes your thing better than this one and i heard this one's good at this and these ypo events these corporate events these these entrepreneurs and business people they don't give a shit they're just go I want to be optimized. I want to feel as good as I possibly can. So they go, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. I'll try it. So you get these people that are like running these m many, multiple, multiple, the, the one, the one guy who did 10 minutes that you're talking about, mm -hmm. he owns like five massive companies. Wow. He, has, he has, he has something like, I don't know, it's like 32,000 employees total throughout all of it. It's nuts. And, and he's big on wanting to be personable within all of them. So he's stressed all the time. He's flying all over the country. And 
they're a lot of fun because when you experience discomfort in life, if you can make a comparison to something in your tangible, regular life, all of a sudden that water becomes nothing, but that water represents the discomfort you feel. The surface of that lot water represents the stage that you step on to go speak when you're, and you're so nervous. If you can get comfortable with breaking the surface of that water, you can be comfortable with anything in your life. You just have to trust and you just have to literally like I'll ask, at the, especially at the YPO events, I'll ask them every single one before they get in. I was like, what are you struggling with in life right now? Because these are people that are leaders that don't think they're allowed to have issues. They don't think they have time to have issues. And that's most of us in general, we, we ignore and we try to deny our issues, our problems, our feelings, our pain points. And, and again, high level entrepreneurs, they don't care. They want performance more than anything. So they'll tell you, they're like, I'm struggling with this or a relationship or whatever. And usually it's something other than business. They're very successful at business and they're compensating with some other area of their life. Maybe it's their relationship at home. So at that moment that they get in that water and they're feeling it and it's like, you bring up that pain point to them man. they'll drop right into their body. It'll hit their emotion. They get into their body and they get out of their brain so fast. See, if you're in your brain, you're, you're thinking of all the threat. So you're going all the, here's all the reasons I should get out. That you can you can literally look at someone and tell if they're in their body or in their head. And if they're in their head and you spot it, you can go, man, it's only a matter of a few seconds before they're gonna be like, nope, I gotta get out. Because they can only combat so many stories. I mean, the story is in a in cold immersion, I'm gonna have a heart attack. It is this, uh, my feet, whatever it is. If you're in your body, yeah, you, your feet hurt. Your, your the tingling starts happening. It feels different than what you normally do. But maybe you labeled it a long time ago as though this is a bad thing. What if you actually change your perspective from focusing on how bad your feet hurt to letting it be a trigger that goes, hey, my feet hurt. Why is that? Oh, it's because all the blood's flushing out of my extremities to come up to, to suck into my core to protect my organs. My organs are getting the most oxygen rich blood they ever have right now. But what do we like? To, we look at the pain as opposed to looking at what the benefit is that is happening. And as soon as people make that shift, you see them just relax a little bit more into their body. It's amazing to watch. It's so cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Grant, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and giving us a little bit of a, a glimpse into your world and the ripple effect that you're making. I mean, think about it, man. If it's some of the people that you're working with are YPO, that they have five businesses, 32,000 employees. And we all know that maybe we don't all know, but young presidents organizations, like young president organizations, just think about it, guys, everyone that's listening, like these people are movers and shakers and leaders, and it's helping them to become more mindful and compassionate leaders. And that's what it's all about. So that is an amazing ripple effect. And I know you have your coaching practice and everything else as well. So I'm stoked to uh, check out your podcast and would encourage the listeners as well. Uh, what's the name of your podcast? Podcast, which is, I mean, by the time this goes live, it'll be a couple of weeks from now, but, but podcasts are evergreen. So definitely check out the podcast. What's it called, Grant? So it's, it's down between two two names. It's either going to be a fly on the wall, which is going to be like here, getting to hear the outside, like almost like you're a fly on the wall of such amazing perspectives and stuff from me and people I'm going to interview. Uh, but the one I'm really leaning into is the darkness becomes you and the mm -hmm. darkness being your truth, because eventually you experience so much pain in life from avoiding your truth that eventually you just kind of become it and you go oh, and you start owning everything that you are. I love a fly on the wall. I think that is so awesome. And if you can incorporate both of those into a tagline, it's great. I'll, uh, I'll pass on some unsolicited advice since you didn't ask, but uh, it's come my way in the past with podcasting, but like, it's not so much advice, but a topic like thinking about like, naming it so that you can evolve and mold into different things. For example, I've had a podcast called clone yourself. I've had a podcast called Mojo Mondays. I've had one called brand hero. I've had one called what up Silicon Valley. And I love that the only one I have now for the past five years, ever since I started this one is soul seeker because everything that I'm about can go under the brand of soul seeker. And for me, when I hear fly on the wall, I just love that name. It makes so much sense for podcasting and you can always play with the taglines underneath that. Um, but same thing with the darkness becomes you. If you want to stay with, you know, leaning in shadow work, we know that's going to be the topic. There's the through line 
anyway, getting to marketing and branding, some uh, other stuff. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Check out the show notes. You can find the playlist to the music playlist that I mentioned, connect with Grant, his social media, and so much more. Grant, thank you so much again for coming on the show. Sam, thanks so much, brother. It was awesome. Always.